Mark Delaney, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks for having me, John. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm super excited to chat with you today. It's so much fun to have these conversations. Today, we're going to be focusing on how to be a leader across language and cultural barriers. And you're going to be sharing your thoughts from a U.S. military context and what you've seen in terms of leadership in the military that allows you and others to lead across language and cultural barriers. As we get started, I wanted to share Mark's bio with everybody. Mark Delaney graduated from the University of Maryland with a BA in English and a minor in leadership studies. Upon graduating, he commissioned as an officer in the U.S. Army. Over the course of three deployments, he led cross-functional teams doing humanitarian work in Syria, developed readiness training for bases in Iraq, and advised senior officers in the Saudi military. After eight years in the Army, Mark left the military to pursue an entrepreneurial path. Experiencing the challenges of entering back into civilian life, he started a website and podcast to help other veterans navigate the difficult journey. Currently, he's working on his MBA from the University of Virginia, Darden School of Business while developing a software program to improve how veterans re-enter civilian life. What a wonderful background, uh, some really great work that you're doing. Uh, anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background before we launch on in? Yeah, if I can just provide like a, a, a kind of quick overview of what I did in the military, just because I think you know, a lot of people may, may necessarily know, you know, what, what all these terms and everything mean. So my, my first job was, a, was an infantry officer. So when you think infantry, when you, whatever your image is of army guy, that, that that's what I did. Okay. So then I transitioned into a role uh, called civil affairs. And so we were a small part of the special operations community. And so essentially what we did was we would go overseas and usually in um, you know, not conflict zones, right? We're, we're usually going kind of everywhere else. And we'd be working with local, local governments, community leaders, nonprofits, uh, local security forces on effort trying to identify you know, what are some, some security challenges or some potential pain points in the civilian population that bad actors might exploit, uh, you know, to, to cause harm to the security situation. So then I would work with, work with those same people, those same stakeholders. And a lot of times the, the U S state department to try and come up with programs, projects, and solutions to address those security concerns and prevent them from, uh, going the way we didn't want them to go. Yeah, excellent. Thank you for that additional background and uh, super important work. And then, of course, you you get back from your deployments, your military experience, and you re-enter a civilian life. And I, I really have no way of fully understanding that. I've only seen it portrayed in movies and TV shows, um, but it seems like for for many, if not most, it's an incredibly challenging uh, thing and a, a, a challenging adjustment. So the work you're doing there to to help with that transition. Uh, with veterans, I think is, is super important and to be applauded. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So let's talk a little bit more then about how your military experience informs this question of how a leader can be effective leading across language and cultural barriers. Yeah. So I'll, I'll bring myself back to, to Syria. So I got to Syria uh, mid-2017. So it was, it was, I think I got there in June 2017. And it was going to be a six-month deployment. Okay, so at this at this time, uh, you know, most people think of Syria and they think of the Syrian civil war, and that was you know clearly a, a major thing that was going on in the country at the time. But the main reason my team and you know U.S. forces were there were to uh, combat ISIS. Okay, so at the time, ISIS had their capital, their, their self-declared capital in the city of Raqqa, and so we were based about 50 miles north. And I was working with a local government council. Okay, so one of the things you know. ISIS did really well, surprisingly, is govern. They were extremely effective. You know, they had their own, their own DMV, their own currency. You know, they were doing all the things that a government would do because essentially because the Syrian government wasn't doing it there. And so there was a power vacuum. They were able to step in, get a lot of power. And then through, you know, both that and sheer brutality, we were able to you know, take over a large portion of the country. Okay. So I was working with this, this local council that was poised to take over government control, you know, assuming that we were going to be able to kick ISIS out militarily, but we knew, you know, we're going to be able to get them out, but then these people, someone's going to need to, to govern this area once these people are gone. So my team was responsible for working with this organization and helping them prepare to, to take over that role. So my day-to-day -day was working with Syrian civilians and, you know, these, uh, these government leaders and these council leaders who were going to be working through the city. So it was a lot of, 
And my, my day-to-day every day was, was cross-cultural dialogue. It was working through an interpreter and trying to build you know, trust and relationships across language and cultural barriers so that we could both try and achieve you know, our, our shared objectives of bringing peace and stability to you know, this portion of Syria. Yeah, well, that's super interesting. And I can only imagine how, uh, how challenging that kind of a context would be. Um, maybe talk to some of those, those tensions that you felt, you know, cross-cultural leadership, cross-cultural communication um, is, is a challenge in kind of the best um, kind of benign circumstances. But when you're in a situation like this in Syria with ISIS, with, with all the conflict that's going on, um, the stakes are so high and uh, the difference is so great. So maybe can you talk a little bit about some of the specific things you tried to do uh, to, to respond to those, those barriers and to, you know, if not minimize, at least uh, find, find ways uh, to, to diminish or overcome, you know, them in the, the, the amount of uh, uh, effort it would take, you know, to, to try to, to work within that kind of a condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll tell two stories. And the, the first one will be kind of more serious. And then the second one will be a little more, more lighthearted. Okay, so the, the first one, so I've been working with the, the State Department, and it was the uh, United States Agency for International Development, a couple of their team members who were there. And, you know, we knew there was some major fighting going on in the city of Raqqa. And we knew that there was, there was going to be, there were going to be a lot of rubble in the street, there were people who needed water, people who needed assistance, you know, once we were able to get resources into the city. And so we were forecasting and realizing, okay, we're going to need some, some serious heavy equipment to come in and help this council, you know, clear their city out and be able to get people back into the city. So we're going to need things like front end loaders and bulldozers and, you know, water trucks to deliver water to people because, you know, there's water contamination, contamination issues going on, excuse me. And so kind of in a, you know, typical U S government hubris here, we put together this $10 million package and, of you know equipment and 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 front end loaders and everything, um, and we didn't necessarily consult the the Syrians we were working with directly on this, which was you know in hindsight a, a glaring glaring hole in our plan. Okay, so I go into them, I go into the office to to talk to my uh, my partners one day, and I say, hey, you know we have this huge package, this ten million dollar package of equipment coming coming to help you all out, and they're like, hey Mark, that's great, we don't want it. Whoa, okay, so I was like, what? So I, you had to go back to my boss and say, hey, sir, uh, you know, this, you know, $10 million of U.S. taxpayer dollar, uh, U.S. taxpayer money that's coming to the Syrians. Well, turns out they don't want it. So this was obviously a huge issue. You know, we, we couldn't spend all this money and then have the people who was designed for it not take it. Okay. So initially everyone was, was starting to kind of lose their minds a little bit because this was, you know, a huge expenditure and we, we had to have this plan work. And I said, okay, let, let, let's take stock of, of what's going on here. We know these people, one, you know, they're, they're a very new government organization. This was not a council that had been around for years. They had just been formed and were really just trying to fill the void of providing services to their people. So they didn't necessarily have a whole lot of legitimacy in, in the eyes. And it's kind of one of the eyes of the people. And it's one of the things we were working on them with. So in their eyes, they're like, okay, we, we kind of want to flex our our muscles here a little bit and say, we don't have, we don't have to take the help of the United States government. We don't have to take this stuff. So some aspect of that was just me being empathetic to their situation and trying to understand their perspective in, in the deal. Okay. I was like, okay, I know that. And I also know that this is a really good deal and they're not going to want to pass it up. All right. So we kind of put together our team of, you know, my direct team members from the military, some people from the state department. I said, okay, we need to go in and assuage the concerns of our partners and just listen to them. So we go in one afternoon and it was a four hour conversation. It was probably 120 degrees outside that day. I drank countless cups of tea, Turkish coffee, uh, smoked a couple of cheap Syrian cigarettes. Don't tell my mom that, but sometimes it's what you got to do in, in different cultures. Okay. And I just sat there and listened to them for hours just listen to them talk about, you know, their problems, listen to them talk about, you know, why they didn't want to take this. And, you know, about three and a half hours in, we, we decided to take a break. And I remember, I remember leaving the building and, you know, the, the couple of people that I was working with, the Americans, we kind of crowned to a corner and I said, you know what, we're going to come back from this and they're going to say they're, they're going to want to take this. We just needed to talk to them for a little while and let them express their concerns. 
And everyone was a little hesitant because, you know, again, this was a, a huge deal. And we go back into the room and they say, you know what, Mark, we're ready to take it. We want it. And I, I take a lot of pride in that. And the, the kind of the lessons I learned in the kind of cross-cultural dialogue, uh, there's a few things. So one, leading up to that, I'd built a lot of trust with these people. They had seen me go in, work with them day in and day out. They had seen me, you know, go, they see me and my team go and, you know, deliver 50 pound bags of rice to people who were super hungry and trying to escape ISIS. So we'd built up a lot of trust and credibility already. Okay. Um, secondly, you know, we, we brought empathy to the situation. We tried to understand, you know, what, what is their perspective? What are, what do they, what do they want? And how can we, how can we meet those concerns? And then this is a, this is a smaller thing. So I, I do have some training in Arabic. I kind of tell people I can probably only hold a conversation with about a six-year-old, you know, but I, I was working through an interpreter, but having some baseline understanding of the language, one provided me some kind of general context of what was going on. It also helped me to kind of keep my, my interpreter in check. And I'll also say, you know, even when I made these kind of infantile attempts to try and speak Arabic, man, they really appreciated it. And, you know, they were super patient and they just loved to see me fumble my way through trying to speak their language. And they just appreciated the effort. And I kind of take like those three things brought into there and think like that's, there's like the lessons that I learned from, from that experience of, of how to succeed in that kind of cross-cultural, you know, challenge. And then I, the, the, oh, can please, I just say, I, I love, yeah. I love that story. Um, it highlights so many really important principles and the first of which is just like you listen to them. And, and that was the, the first kind of misstep of the approach in the first place, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it's a super common misstep. Uh, if you're talking about military, government outreach, uh, humanitarian outreach, NGOs going throughout the world, it's, it's the same problem emerges again and again and again, where you yeah. have well-meaning individuals who want to make a difference and they're trying to, you know, share resources, time, energy to make, you know, a positive difference. And they forget the simple act of like talking to the local people, the, 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 the people who live, who are going to be impacted, talk to them, listen to them, uh, try to understand them, ex, you know, ha have a better understanding of the lived experience that you're right. actually trying to respond to that in and of itself uh, breaks down barriers. And it, it, allows you to, to take a step forward. And so just the fact that you were willing to sit with them and to listen was huge. The fact that you respected their culture, and that you were able to interact with them in meaningful ways and even try to speak a language that you didn't, uh, you know, you didn't speak very well, you had to fumble. It's incredibly endearing to see someone really trying very hard to, to be authentically and genuinely connected with the people they're talking to and to not come in, you know, we, we often talk about like the white savior complex of we're right, going to go in right. and fix everyone else and right. show you what the right way is. That's of course, I mean, if you think of, for, about it that way, would you want someone coming into your community doing that to you? Would that be off-putting? Would that make you defensive and a little skeptical? Of course it would, it would to all of us. And, and so we need to, you know, have a little bit of empathy and understanding and recognize of that, of course, people are going to feel that way. And it's not them feeling, un, you know, being ungrateful or whatever, you know, kind of defensiveness we might have in response. It's, it's just a, a, a simple matter of like, let's really stop, listen, value the cultures that we're interacting with, make a, a good faith, honest effort to connect with them in a meaningful way. And if we can do that, man, that breaks down a lot of those barriers. Yeah. Yeah. To totally, totally agree. Uh, I'll tell one more story to kind of provide some, I, I think like the, the, the fourth layer of, you know, working across cultures that I think is super important and that's flexibility and adaptability. Okay. So I had a meeting one day where I was going to go to the, the local elementary school and we were putting together a project kind of schools have been closed for six years there. And so we were start we we're working with some of the local schools to get them, get them back up and running. And so I was going to meet with the local principal. And I don't know if anyone remembers, this was back in 2017, there was a, a huge eclipse that came to the United States. It was like a total blockout. It was a really big event, but uh, you couldn't see it everywhere in the world, okay? Now, the people that I was working with were extremely timely. Like if, you know, I said if I was meeting them at one o'clock, we were sitting down at one o'clock. Like that was, we were very hard on that, okay? And, and they were too. Um, and so I go, to, I go to the meeting and I'm outside the school and I don't see any kids around. I'm like, what's what's, what's, what's going on here? And so this guy's walking down the street and I ask him like, Hey, why, why aren't the kids in school today? 
And he looks at me like I'm just crazy. And he goes, Mark, the, the eclipse is today. We're not going to send our kids to school today. You, are you crazy? And you know, we, my, my team, we all look up to the sky. It's, the, the eclipse was not happening in this part of Syria at all. It was completely clear sky. I could see the sun. It was fantastic. And we're like, uh, okay, I guess, I guess no, you're, you're correct. I would not send my kids to school today. I don't know what I was thinking. So, you know, we hop back in our trucks and go back to base and I run into my boss and he goes, D- didn't you just leave? Didn't you have a meeting, you know, across town? And I was like, uh, yeah, sir. But you know, they had to cancel it because of the eclipse. And so then you know, he, you know, looks out, he looks out the window and looks up at the sky, does the same thing we did and says, there's no, there's no eclipse here. What, what, what are you talking about? And, you know, he, he gave me that trust to say, okay, you know what? We, we did have a, a mission we were planning on doing today. And you, you had something, you had an objective you were trying to achieve, but we're going to adapt to their culture and, you know, the people that we're working with and recognize that this isn't the end of the world. And, you know, the relationship is not burned and we, we can make this happen another day while also being respectful of the people that we're working with. Um, and so, yeah, there was, there was a lot of trust kind of both like from me to them. And then also like from my boss to me, knowing that understanding the, the people they were working with was critical to what we were trying to achieve. Yeah. And again, I mean, it's a simple thing Uh, you you mentioned before even sharing the story. This one's a little bit of a funnier story. Um, But how often do we go into those situations and then try to basically steamroll (laughs) over the people that we're meeting with? And, you know, whether it's intentional or not, you know, kind of even the subtle content. Uh, uh, condescension and, and just making them feel inferior in some way, because, you know, of course we have the right understanding and what they're doing right. is silly. Like those types of subtle messages get sent, even when there aren't words that express them just in the body language and the facial expressions and those sorts of things. And so if, if you can just really make sure that you honor, um, you know, what other people hold to be important. Uh, it doesn't mean you need to agree, and and maybe you don't think an eclipse in, in an area where you can't see the eclipse matters. <laughs> but I I do remember that day. Yeah. Um, we could see it very well here in Utah, and uh, I don't believe our kids had the day off. Um, maybe they did, or maybe they got out early that day. Um, but I do remember um, making sure that everyone had the opportunity to see it. Yeah, uh, and yeah. that was that was very important. Um, and and so of course we we need to recognize you know, what's important to the people we're trying to serve and whether that, you know, maps with what we care about or not, it doesn't actually matter. Yeah, to- totally agree. And it, it, it's very easy. And, and we, we try to look at it too, from a, a spectrum of, of time, you know, I, I think very often, especially in the military, you know, we, we were deploying overseas and we were only going to be there for six months. Like those are the length of our deployments, but these people, I mean, this is, this is where they live. This is their home. They're going to be here for for years and decades. So while maybe we have the pressure of, I, I've got objectives to achieve. I have reports I got to write. Like I need to, you know, do these things day to day to day because I'm only here for a constrained period of time. The people we were working with didn't have those constraints, and so it was really important, I think, for us to to realize that um, and adapt to their environment that we were stepping into versus you know them adapting to us. Yeah, it's it's it is a lot of hubris to expect you know, if we're going into a different community to expect them to adapt to our, um, our timetable, our, our, our understanding, right. our time frame, right? Um, I, and that's what you had just expressed is actually, again, a, a very super common problem, the kind of the time frame, um, the, the, uh, the scope and scale of what we're trying to accomplish for us in the moment seems super important. Uh, we're being held accountable to these things, but maybe we're only there for a month. Maybe we're there for six months. Maybe we're there for even a year, but the communities we're going into have been there for decades, generations, centuries, perhaps. Um, they're going to continue to be there. And just because we think we have something that's going to be a solution for them, uh, you know, the, what we're, what us showing up isn't, always going to be as important to them as we think it is <laughs> right. um, because right. it's, it's really, a, it's really just a, a brief moment in time uh, within the grand scheme of, of, of the, the scale of, and scope of time and what they experience. So all of these, I think are just super important reminders and messages that we need to, uh, to learn and relearn. Um, I, I thought I, I should also ask just because, um, 
you know, you went through the Army Ranger School. Any other kind of general lessons in leadership that you uh, that that you took away from that that has helped guide you as you've come back from military service and gone into your other entrepreneurial endeavors? Yeah, there, there, there there's a few things. Um, the first one that I'll point out, and this is a the the first one that I'll point out. And I didn't learn this one directly from from Army Ranger School, but I, along the way in my my career, I got the chance to meet up with uh, Sid Cracknell. I might be pronouncing his last name correctly. Incorrectly, excuse me. Uh, he was a former retired two star general. He passed away in the last couple of years, but a, amazing story this guy had. Grew up uh, in Lithuania as a as a Jew in, in Europe when the Nazis invaded. Spent some time in a work camp. Escaped. Found his way in the United States. You know, basically got told. He started school for the first time when he was 17 and, you know, didn't speak a lick of English, got a degree, and then rose up to the ranks of a, a two-star general in the army. Just truly amazing story this guy has. And I remember him telling us, you know, we were meeting him for a, for a book club, actually. And he said, you know what? The, a rule that I was trying to remember in life is that life is easy. It's just hard. And there's so many of the, you know, these kind of things we, we've talked about, these lessons today of, um, you know, how easy it is to step into situations with hubris and everything and recognize that we, oftentimes like we know the right answer. We know like what we're supposed to do, but just it's the implementation of it and actually like putting the right foot in front um, and making it happen becomes the hard part. And that's like a lesson I've tried to take from my military experience and apply to everything else that like, I, I know what the right answer is. I just have to do it. And it's the doing part that becomes the challenge. Yeah. Doing is always the hardest thing implementing you know having the good idea having the thought the principle that's great but putting it into action is always uh, the real challenge but it's also where the real impact happens uh in our personal lives and our families our communities well mark it has just been a real pleasure talking with you the time has flown by i noticed that we're getting close to the end of our time together today but before we close i wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you find out more about your work um, and then give us a final word on the topic for today yeah sure so uh, you can go to my website the the veteranpro.com so i put information and resources for veterans interested in higher education entrepreneurship and professional careers and then the next evolution of the project was to start a, a podcast. So it's the, the veteran semi-professional. And so I added the semi in there because I wanted to open it up to conversations about, you know, mental health and, you know, nonprofits that are working to improve veterans and not just, you know, strictly career talk. Uh, so I kind of expanded the, the, the breadth of the brand there with, with the podcast. And so you can check, find the, the veteran semi-professional on anywhere you listen to podcasts. Uh, and then lastly, you know, if you want to reach out to me personally, you can find me on LinkedIn, Mark Delaney, and you'll, you'll see podcaster veteran professional next to my name. And that, that's the guy you want to reach out to. Perfect. And I definitely encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about Mark, uh, find out more about his current initiatives because they're very, uh, important, uh, initiatives that we want to try to support any final word on leadership for today before we close yeah you know the the, the three things that i was trying to put into any type of leadership situation are you know purpose direction and motivation of providing people what, what's the why on what we're doing what, what's going to push you to do something and how can we find that and how can we all kind of be in agreement on that and then direction i think you know leaders of god provide some type of vision of wherever the team and the organization is going and you know if you're if you're a team of if you're, if you're a team of one you can have some type of direction you know you're pushing towards and then the last bit of the, is motivation and you know the, the surface level stuff of that is you know uh, telling people good job right but then also you're know, making extra efforts to to reach out to people that maybe um maybe need some help maybe they need people that can be brought into the fold a little bit more wherever they are or you know when someone does a really good job showing that in front of everyone. And that's kind of what I look at is like the, the, the factors of motivation. So purpose, direction, and motivation. Those are the, the principles that I try and apply to any type of leaders, leadership situation. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, well said. Thank you, Mark, for sharing your time, your insights, all your experience with me and my listeners today. Again, I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.